Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. And welcome to our uh, careers webinar today. This is uh, Sp STEM and Space is organizing our next webinar. And our featured guest today is Dr. Siddharth Pandey. So welcome, Dr. Pandey. Thank you so and, much for uh, having me, ma'am. Right. And uh, with me is also Arjun Gulia, who's going to be helping uh, and supporting this session. So today we have a treat for you because Dr. Pandey is in a very unusual, unusual subject. Let me introduce him. Uh, Dr. Pandey is the head of the Center of Excellence in Astrobiology and, uh, at Amity University. Uh, uh, as a part of this, uh, just a second. As a part of this, he's leading an initiative to establish India's first dedicated center for astrobiology and space biology research in the country. Siddharth is a space engineer with project management and leadership experience working with teams of astrobiologists. Prior to this, he has experience in building sample collection instruments for Mars and Venus surface missions while working at NASA Ames in the US. He has been engaged in education and public outreach activities and is motivated to use space as a tool to spread awareness, social consciousness, and inclusiveness within our communities. He holds PhD degrees in aerospace engineering from UNSW Canberra, Australia, MS, uh, which is a master's in space systems engineering from TU Delft in Netherlands and BTEC in aerospace engineering from Amity University, India. So welcome again, uh, Dr. Pandey. Thank you so much, ma'am. So uh, I, I invite you now to talk about your personal journey, how you got, got to this field and what is the kind of work you do in astrobiology? Thank you so much and very uh, good evening and warm greetings to others uh, who might be watching live or probably watching the recording from other parts of, uh, of the world. I will uh, quickly share my screen now so that uh, it will help me give an introduction to uh, my talk as well as a little bit about myself. So as being very kindly introduced by um, Mela Ma'am, I am uh, Siddharth Pandey. And currently I am in Mumbai and uh, I am working in the field of astrobiology. So for those of you who are not familiar with this field, it basically has to do with everything where you're trying to understand where did life come from? Can life be found elsewhere in the universe? And how do you look for life? So all the movies that you have been uh, you know, watching about aliens, uh, so that has a lot to do with the kind of work we do. But we focus ourselves, at least the work that I do, we focus on the planets and other moons that are existing in our solar system. Um, so we particularly focus on the boring kind of aliens, if you might call it, but we find them very interesting. We want to look at how exactly did life start. So we're interested in the living microorganisms that might in fact be found you know, in, in uh, different parts of our own solar system. And I'd also like to point out that many people confuse us for astrology. And that is something that has nothing to do with what we do. Astrology, in my opinion, and the opinion of many people is not a valid science. Um, it is a repository of information of astronomy. And a lot of implications are drawn out by people about how planets and their movement affect human lives. Well, there haven't been any scientific um, you know, pursuits that can rationally explain them. But uh, for better or for worse, uh, whichever side you might choose to believe, uh, we are not astrology, we are astrobiology. So this is just to kind of put a disclaimer out there that this is the kind of work uh, we are only involved in. And another thing that I'd like to point out is that the field of astrobiology, a lot of people only focus on the biology part. They think that it has to do only with biology. 
but i'd like to point out that we are not only biology we are a lot more than that so if you are not interested in biology but are still interested in finding aliens there are many different kinds of subjects you can study and still become an astrobiologist so this is one point i'd like to bring out right at the start of my discussion so a little bit about myself many of you will be students and uh, many of you would be passionate about space and i'm thinking one of the reasons why you're listening to me on uh, this uh, evening is because you want to understand what are the different steps that are involved when you want to have a career as a space researcher or a space scientist so i started off in india i did my undergraduate from amity university in uh, noida and i got a uh, degree in uh, aerospace engineering bachelor's in aerospace engineering and i was passionate from a age of about 14 about aerospace i was really really following very closely the path that has been chosen by different astronauts i was always uh, you can say intrigued by the work that they do and what kind of uh, life skills or the kind of education skill set they would be needing and i was very closely following kalpana chavla who is of course our indian origin astronaut who worked at nasa and uh, who passed away unfortunately in 2003 in a space shuttle uh, accident um so i was very closely following her life path where all she studied you know what kind of degrees she sought and i realized that you have to if you want to become an astronaut or if you want to become a space researcher you need to be really really well educated and highly specialized in a particular area within aerospace engineering so that took me you know on a journey around this planet literally i was very fortunate to get the opportunity after india i was in iit bombay after amity for one year as a research fellow and right after that i got the opportunity to go to the netherlands uh, to study in the university of delft technical university of delft and undertook a masters in uh, aerospace engineering with a focus on space systems and while i was working uh, while i was studying in the netherlands i got an opportunity to uh, travel to the united states and initially it was for a internship at nasa and uh, eventually that internship position slowly rolled into a research a visiting researcher position so for two years i was there at nasa ames research center and i think that was one of the most inspiring and the most exciting uh, first impressions that i got of aerospace engineering because you know many of the textbooks that we read in college i was at a place where some of those textbooks were written or the people who had worked on coming up with certain kinds of uh, equations they had worked at such places so from a historic perspective uh, some of the labs that i worked in i was really really moved to see that you know nothing is out of reach that uh, things that seem to be very far away from you if you are continuing on your path and it could be a slow path but eventually you will reach there so 2012 august i still remember i had stepped into nasa and uh, that was almost what 9 years after i had first dreamt of you know this particular field so th things take time they do not happen overnight you know some dream that you might have in 9th standard you might not realize in 10th standard it might happen a little later but if you stick on to it surely it will you know you you reach there so after i was uh, you know completing my work at nasa i realized that i needed to continue my journey of education my journey of uh, research and experience and uh, i was selected for a full university scholarship because i was there at nasa i was uh, you know i managed to find myself uh, in a very reputable organization and i was doing some good work so the university in australia university of new south wales they considered me uh, you know meritorious enough and i was very fortunate to get this university scholarship uh, and to spend 4 years in uh, in australia which i took up immediately i was really really happy once i was there because i realized what a beautiful country that was and the journey of a phd student is also very unique it is very different from a day job that many engineers you know take up once they go there but slowly and steadily it it builds several personality traits inside you when you are undertaking a phd degree which i think are unique it is not something that you can purchase or uh, you know just go through very quickly you have to spend a lot of time and effort at it when you are trying to solve a problem and you know giving it everything and keeping everything aside i think that is some kind of a 
life experience which helps you not just in your career but also in other aspects of your life so i was there for about 4 years and uh, i was able to get the experience of working in another country which was my third country and uh, finally then from there i got the opportunity and already when i was in australia uh, we were working on establishing some research work here in india itself and uh, even as a phd student i was working on different projects in collaboration with people in india and uh, some of those collaborations materialized and as soon as i completed my phd degree i was offered a job at amity university where in fact i had studied to establish a center for astrobiology because at amity university the leadership you know very uh, wisely recognized that astrobiology is an area which is an emerging field it is an important field where india should be committing its resources to uh, and its efforts to and they saw me as somebody who was having this unique experience and you know should work in this area so i was given that position at a very young age to set up this new center of excellence in astrobiology and i have been there since and have been establishing you know my uh, my work here and i'll talk a bit about my work so like i mentioned uh, february 2003 was the tragic uh, month and uh, kalpana chawla as you see in the top left along with her other crew members they were on space shuttle columbia and while they were coming back after their uh, mission um, unfortunately because of several flaws several damages that were there in the space shuttle uh, the space shuttle had a accident and it exploded while it was coming back into the earth's atmosphere and you know we lost all of those lives and this episode this event left a very strong impression on me when i was uh, in ninth standard i still remember i was in mumbai at that point of time and it slowly made me think about these individuals who you know did not only think about their own locality or their country they were mainly working on an area they were putting their lives at stake for something much larger than that that humanity human kind that has been there on this planet now for what can you say about 50000 years or 70000 years and uh, you know in the last 100 150 years we have seen so much of development that has taken place and these people were working on the forefront to take humanity to the next level they were preparing humanity to reach out to the stars and explore the different worlds that are out there and you know at that age of 14 obviously all of these things don't immediately strike you because you know for you an astronaut's uniform and the space shuttle everything is very cool but once you step back and then you think about it that what exactly was it so there were all of these different things which made this field completely apart from other fields you know in my mind it became that if you are doing so much of hard work if you are doing so much of studies it should better be for something which makes that kind of an impression it is something that at the end of the day even if you are not able to achieve what you set out to achieve you know like they say it is even glorious to fail that even you made that attempt you were able to do something and through that work you were able to inspire people to you know be better versions of themselves so there were all of these positive aspects of the field uh, the sophistication of it the challenge of it was what really you know uh, excited me and this brings me to you know list some questions that you should be asking yourselves and there are no perfect answers for these questions and i think even at this stage i continue to ask myself these questions because the answers keep changing and that is okay answers can keep changing but you should be always asking the right questions you should be asking yourself that you know for me if it was space what is it that you are most excited about what is it that keeps you awake and what change is it that you want to bring about you see a lot of things around you and why is it important to bring about a change is because you get a certain sense of satisfaction certain sense of happiness when you try to bring about a change and that will help you define your challenge and once you're able to define what is it that challenges you you're able to better work and decide you know which kind of career path you're on and the answers are different for everybody and because we are all natural people we come from different walks of life um, we have different upbringings we have different uh, you know requirements in life so this is what you should be asking yourselves more than um how do i earn money because money will follow what really should be something that you should be thinking about at this age because right now you don't have to think about money you have your parents 
your family to support you, you should be really concentrating on what is it that you're excited about. And a little more about what I was excited about was the fact that, you know, uh, this slide shows you how our location in this universe is such that we are one planet in our solar system out of many other planets. And our solar system is basically supported by our sun, which is our star. And it is a normal regular star and you have having in the neighborhood so many other stars in our neighborhood. And eventually they make up our galaxy. We are on the far outer, you know, fringes of our own galaxy. And we are one out of billions other galaxies that make up this entire universe. So, you know, your 300 billion stars itself in our galaxy and there are 200 billion such galaxies in the universe. So the question is, are we alone? Are we at a point of time in space that makes us very unique? Or is it the fact that we are so far away from these other places that we just do not know whether we are alone or not? So the sheer, you can say, timidness, the smallness of ourselves made me really, really excited and made me think more and more about what is out there. Another aspect that I can bring to you is the fact that our planet and many of you, you know, in our school textbooks might have seen this kind of an image where you are having, you know, all our planets and the sun on the, on the left side. And this image has been prepared so that it fits inside a textbook page, right? So that everything is fitted. So you're able to see everything together and you're having the sizes of all the planets as well together. And in some ways it is similar to, in my mind, Lada, uh, to, to Lagan, the movie where uh, Amir Khan is in the center of you know, his entire team. And Earth, in many ways, is similar to that. It is our planet, so it is the hero planet, and it is always kind of shown relatively in the center. It's the main focus of attraction. And then, of course, you, know, you have other planets around it. But the reality is very, very different. You know, to, this is an artist's illustration of the sheer size of the planets that are around us. You can see how big Jupiter and Saturn are. You can see how big the sun is. And Earth is a, it's almost like a pebble kept next to a basketball, two basketballs, right? And of course, Jupiter and Saturn, you might, some of you might have read, are uh, very much visible in our night sky. And uh, a few days from now on the 21st, they'll also be coming very close to each other. That is a conjunction that is happening. But anyway, that is a different topic altogether. But to point out the fact that we are in the neighborhood of all these amazingly large worlds, dynamic worlds that we ourselves have not completely understood. You know, whenever we have a hurricane or a cyclone that comes, you know, uh, that forms in our Bay of Bengal or in the Pacific Ocean, it becomes a new story. But do you know that there are thousands of storms that have been continuously raging in Jupiter and Saturn, and these are much larger systems. And of course, they have no consequence to us. But to point out the fact that there are all of these complex weather patterns, there are all of these physical phenomena that are taking place that we still do not have a complete you know, grasp over. And to say that we have understood everything in our solar system, everything is boring, we should you know, focus more on what is out there. I think that would not be right because there is so many things that we still haven't been able to figure out. So if you look a little more closer to ourselves in our own solar system, you look at two planets, um, Venus on the left side and Mars on the right side. Now, if you focus on these two planets, they were formed at roughly the same time as when Earth was formed. But the reality is such that they are very different from Earth. So, you know, it's almost like you see in the movies, at least in the old movies, we used to have uh, twins where uh, they were really young. One of them eventually goes and becomes a police officer. The other becomes a, a thief. So, you know, what happened in their life journey? How did they become so different? So not to say that, you know, Venus is a, a cop or a, or a thief and Earth is something else, but to point out that what is it that went differently for each of these planets to become like that? Venus is a very hot, super hot, super dense
that are mixed with sulfuric acid and many other kinds of very toxic uh, gases. Mars on the other side, you can very much see uh, um, you know, the planet. There are clouds, but it does not have a very uh, dense atmosphere. It's a cold, dry, arid environment. So very hot on one side and very cold on the other side. But at what point of time in their histories, both Venus and Mars were very similar to what Earth is today. In fact, it has been confirmed that there was liquid water on, in the, on the surface. Um, the temperatures were a lot more favorable. And people are even studying at this point of time whether life existed there or not. So Venus can and Mars can studying them can help us understand how Earth will be in a few years from now. Both are, you can say, two different kinds of futures that Earth might have for itself. So when you study these planets, you don't really, you don't only understand them, but you also understand your own self or your own future, Earth's future. So that is why it is important to study the worlds around us and not to only study Earth, you know, in, a, in an isolation. So that is another important thing that I would like, you know, you all to realize. And, and we are living in very exciting times. The last 20 years has been, you can say, dedicated to Mars exploration. In fact, almost I can say 25 years. And this year itself, uh, even though there was the pandemic and there were all of these, um, you know, tragic things that have taken place, there have been a lot of important missions that have happened. For Mars itself, we've had three missions that have launched, one from NASA um, and uh, the Chinese mission, as well as the uh, UAE mission. So there were three missions that have launched and they'll be landing sometime next year or orbiting, reaching Mars sometime next year. And there are some Indian connections as well that, I, you know, that uh, we can talk about. Uh, one of the students uh, who named the helicopter on Mars, she's an Indian origin, of course, an American student. And uh, one of the engineers who helped design a helicopter. So this small helicopter that you see on the lower left is actually going to be flying as part of the Mars, NASA Mars mission. It will be landing. So the rover lands on Mars. And then you can see on the lower left, a small video which shows this little drone kind of a helicopter, which will be taking off uh, from the rover's platform and then flying a certain distance. And uh, obviously, if you're flying, you're able to cover a lot of ground faster. So it is the first time that humans are flying an aircraft or a helicopter or something that you know flies with the support of the atmosphere of a different planet. So this is the first time something like this is happening. And the engineer who worked on it is also an Indian origin uh, engineer at NASA, uh, Bob Balaram, who was originally from, uh, uh, he studied at IIT Madras. So also to point out that you, know, you will very easily be, if you're working hard in this field, in a position where you will be driving the exploration in, in these kinds of areas, in these frontal areas. And I had, when I was at NASA, I had the opportunity to in fact work on some of the Mars sample return mission uh, designs. So how do you collect samples on the surface of Mars and then bringing, that, bringing them back to Earth you know, for analysis. Um, also to point out that uh, another NASA scientist is in fact an adjunct faculty. She's a, uh, she's a professor at our uh, center. Uh, she's been visiting um, Amity Mumbai every, every year now for the last two years. And uh, in fact, you see the picture on the lower left side. She was, we conducted a workshop here in Mumbai uh, for a lot of students from uh, high school as well as from university. And uh, she's been working on uh, the data that is coming back from the Mars uh, Science Laboratory mission, which was the uh, current ongoing NASA rover mission on Mars. Another very different world that I'd like to bring to your notice is Titan. So Titan is a moon of Saturn, and it is a very different moon. Unlike the other places which are drier, Titan actually has a lot of liquid on its surface. It is so cold that you actually have methane which is normally in gaseous form here on Earth, because of the low temperature, it exists in liquid form. So almost you can imagine a world, alien world, where there is clouds, rainfall, rivers, lakes, as well as oceans of methane. 
and this is very exciting because on earth we have a lot of life which is supported by water because water is an essential um, you know compound that can help transfer a lot of nutrients and energies which is very important for life it could be that the life form that exists on titan is actually methane based so to explore this further nasa is sending a mission called dragonfly mission which will be uh, you know launching in the next uh, within the next decade to uh, to explore titan and this image that you see on the right side is an image of titan and some of those those clarified images actually shows the reflection of the sun as it is falling on the surface of the water body or, or, or not the water the, the methane body on on the surface of titan so another very exciting world you know to consider and if you go a little further away you have icy moons so moons of jupiter and saturn so europa is a moon of jupiter and enceladus is a moon of saturn which are completely covered with an ice shell so almost like you can think of antarctica or you know the arctic regions which are having an ice uh, layer of ice which is called the ice shell but this image on the top left side that you see uh, was an image that was taken by the cassini mission cassini was a nasa mission that was a uh, nasa european mission that was sent uh, to uh, you know explore saturn and as it was flying past um, enceladus it was able to confirm that there are these little fountains you see on the left side of of uh, the slide you see these images of um, these little you can say fountains of water that is coming out from underneath the surface so the the fact that there are these cracks in these ice from which uh, you know uh, some kind of a liquid is uh, you know being spit out and once the cassini mission was able to fly through the plumes they were able to analyze the ice particles that were coming out and confirm that it is actually liquid water so water oceans have been confirmed to exist underneath the icy shells and again this is also very exciting because here on earth we have seen just like you see here on the lower right side that beneath ice shells on earth in very very cold environments on the bottom of the ocean surface you actually have these uh, kind of uh, they're called black smokers so places from where um, hot gases are coming out and around these hot gases you find a lot of kind of life that exists there so nasa is sending another mission called europa which will not be actually going down but it will be flying orbiting around these icy moons and collecting samples and eventually we might even be able to send a mission that drills down and goes underneath and explores and finds perhaps some kind of uh, you know smoking activity hot spring activity that is taking place underneath so this is to give you an overview of this wonderful area of a uh, very quick overview of area of astrobiology and uh, our center uh, attempts to conduct research and education in some of these areas so we are at amity university in mumbai we are the first center uh, in india that focuses you know singularly focuses on the field of astrobiology and we are having different focus areas so this image that you saw on the previous slide is actually from ladakh many of you might have been there uh, some of you might have not been there but if you get the opportunity i'll talk about a project where you might get an opportunity to work in ladakh so ladakh is a very high altitude cold uh, desert environment and uh, it's exciting because it is similar to what early mars was like so mars about 2 billion years ago actually had a warm wet surface and the conditions we find today in ladakh are similar to what existed on mars 2 billion years ago so it helps us understand whether life existed on mars or not when we study the kind of organisms that are found in ladakh today so it is an analog this is something known as a mars analog so we study ladakh as well as lonar crater i'll talk about lonar crater as well it is in maharashtra uh we also are developing different kinds of experiments that will be flying into space uh, with the help of isro and uh, we also undertake a lot of education mentoring of students as well as uh, engaging in public uh, discussions and towards that we have several different partnerships you know that we have formed with uh, you know international universities and other organizations research organizations 
So since 2016, uh, like I mentioned, uh, as part of a NASA program called NASA Space Outbound Program, um, I had coordinated in uh, partnership with several collaborators from NASA, Australia, Europe, as well as in India, uh, a field expedition in 2016 that allowed us to visit Ladakh and study some of these different sites. So what you see here is basically a hot spring site where you have water that is coming out from underneath the uh, surface of uh, you know, Ladakh. And it helps us understand what kind of microbial organisms are growing in these kinds of very high altitude environment. So that is exactly what the field of astrobiology is all about. It is about helping understand how do organisms live in extreme environment. So when I say extreme, I basically mean in very hot conditions, in very cold conditions, in places where there is a lot of salt, in places where there is a very high amount of ultraviolet radiation, such as in Ladakh, because Ladakh's altitude is so high, you have a lot more amount of UV radiation that comes through. The atmospheric pressure is also very, very less. So the oxygen is less. So we try and understand how life has evolved over all these years to live in such extreme conditions. Because if you're trying to look for life elsewhere, it will probably be found in these kind of extreme conditions. So this is what we do. We visit these kinds of areas and uh, we have been conducting work in Ladakh and there are several different kinds of sites. There are hot springs, there are saline lakes, there are sand dunes, and uh, you know, it helps us uh, de define our experiments. So how do you get a chance? So if for those of you who are in 11th standard, 12th standard and above, undergraduate and above, uh, we have announced recently a program for next year, 2021, which will be conducted in the summer. So all the way from June until October, there will be an opportunity to spend one week as a team and you will be led by a space scientist to work in Ladakh. And I've put the link there. I'll also share it over the chat for uh, the others to you know, take a note of it. And uh, you can register your interest right now. And in January end, uh, middle to end of January, there'll be more information on the formal registration process. So the objective is you will be getting an opportunity to spend time in a Mars-like environment, guided and uh, instructed by a space science uh, you know, researcher or an instructor, and to help you understand what is it that is like to live on a different environment, on a different planet, and what are the different kinds of uh, training methodologies that are imparted to astronauts when they're training to go to these kinds of environments. So normally these programs are held in the US or in Australia, and this is for the first time we are planning to set up something like this, you know, here in India. So I think it is a great opportunity. And after this expedition, uh, you will get a chance to join a network of uh, ambassadors who will go around speaking to others about the importance of Ladakh and similar sites in our country for space exploration, and also get a chance to get mentored by the different uh, scientists, you know, who will be part of uh, this entire program as well. So I'd say as soon as this talk is over, speak with your other colleagues and uh, students as well, and you know, try and uh, put something together. So I will not go into further detail about uh, the exact activities, but if there is interest, perhaps afterwards I can take that on. And uh, this is the other site in central India. It is called Lonar. So for those of you who are not familiar with Lonar Crater, uh, uh, this is a crater site in central India, in uh, Maharashtra. So a crater is formed when you have a meteorite entering into the Earth's atmosphere with a very high velocity, and it comes in, it makes a massive impact with a very high velocity into the Earth's surface. And right after that is done, you have this kind of a concave structure that is formed, you know, because all the energy that is there, it pushes aside the material, and you have this kind of a crater formation that takes place. And this is a crater site that we have in India, and currently there's a lake that has filled up inside it as water from a stream has you know, flowed in. And this is very similar to a crater that exists on Mars. And the NASA rover that is heading to Mars is actually going to be landing inside a crater. So we are trying to understand, and, and that NASA rover is actually going to be looking for any signs of previous life. So our work is to help understand the crater here on Earth and come up with ways in which we can better inform, you know, some of the experiments that will be conducted on Mars. So that was all about the analog work. Um, 
like i mentioned we are also in the in the middle of developing different kinds of experiments that can be flown into space uh, we got selected for two opportunities uh, from isro to fly experiments uh, into uh, low earth orbit which is called leo which is roughly about 500 kilometers above the earth 500 to 600 kilometers above the earth and uh, currently the experiment that we are flying is basically a small compact experiment where we are trying to understand how do plants or plant sample uh, you know plant samples how do they grow uh, in the absence or the uh, or in very low levels of gravity so it is a first technology test that we are doing and once successful we will be increasing the complexity and you know flying more and more uh, you can say complex scientific missions as part of this and this will be uh, the first biological experiment uh, in india if this flies you know when this flies so we currently hoping to fly by the middle of this year uh, you know assuming everything goes according to plan in terms of the schedule because there are delays on on several occasions but this is very very exciting for us and this is completely been built by students so these are students from undergraduate engineering as well as biotechnology uh, who you know worked together and have developed this you know entirely so this is basically the vision that we have uh, that we would like to conduct experiments in our own backyard you know in our uh, mars like environments on earth we want to conduct experiments in low earth orbit and eventually we want to work towards experiments on the moon and eventually on mars so this is the plan with which we are moving and uh, you know we want to be the first group of people in india that can help understand how does life uh, evolve how does it sustain itself in in space as well as on on moon and mars so i would like to leave you all with one message from uh, kalpana chavla where she said that the path from dreams to reality exists may you have the vision to see it the courage to get on it and the perseverance to to get through it so thank you very much for your time and i'll be happy to take some questions okay. thank you dr pandey that was really fascinating and i'm sure the students would also have enjoyed learning about all this uh yeah so arjun do you want to bring some questions yes yeah, there yes, are a lot of questions so, on our youtube so we picked a few to bring it to you yes so the first question i'll take is from uh, vitoshri biswas she is asking so you said the, the dark is like early mars was there liquid water on the early on early mars yes there was and that has actually been confirmed now we see a lot of uh, dried up rivers and lake beds we see a lot of rocks that normally are formed in the presence of water we see different kinds of sand dunes that that form so it has been confirmed that very much there was liquid water on the surface okay very nice so again so i have another question from uh, vishal mehta so he is saying so was oxygen discovered during cassini mission the moons on saturn moons yes so so they had discovered oxygen carbon hydrogen uh, nitrogen phosphorus sulfur so these are all the essential uh, you can say building blocks of life that were discovered very much okay okay thanks sir so another question is from zenith the knowledge he said sir i am confused that mars had life earlier but what now so but because mars was similar like earth millions of years ago so we still do not know whether there was life or not we know that the conditions were there which were earth like but you can only confirm the presence of life when you have found either some kind of uh, organic remains of that particular life and normally these organic remains are not preserved because of all kinds of weathering activity that you know tends to take place however uh, we have seen that clays so you know on the river side when you go you will find a lot of this wet mud which is clay so clay actually has uh, a very good preservation potential it can preserve uh, organic material for hundreds and thousands or in cases even millions of years and we have seen that on earth as well so the objective now is to explore parts of mars where uh, the likelihood of the preservation is high where we can find you know the proof of that or even you look at rocks where you can find some kind of fossilization that has taken place so these are some things that are currently being done so unless and until we don't confirm the presence of any 
proof of past life we cannot say that there was life on the surface of mars but mm. everything so far whatever we are seeing is leading us in that direction so hopefully when we have spent more time on the surface uh, we have explored it further we will be able to say for sure whether life existed or whether it did not exist okay okay thank you so much for the answer again i have another question from navya pillai she says sir oh uh, basically do we search for life on asteroids as well that's a very good question um, simply because uh, very recently we had a mission that came back called hayabusa 2 it was a japanese mission uh, which recently has returned samples from uh, an asteroid called rugu and it is i think you know it has not been covered enough it is one of the most challenging things to do and it has done a very successful job at bringing back samples from an asteroid now asteroids by themselves do not have all the environmental conditions to support life but what they do have is perhaps some of the essential uh, materials that are required for life to start so even though an ast if you find the proof of any um, you can say essential minerals or elements on an asteroid it it might not mean that there was life on that particular asteroid but what you can perhaps infer from that is that there might have been life <coughs> there might have been there there uh, you know there could be life that arose from the minerals that are found on that particular asteroid so it plays a very important role asteroids are basically you know like when you bake a cake at home or when you when you make anything at home when you cook something at home after you have finished cooking you find uh, you know your masalas you find your uh, if you are baking a cake you will find some maida and everything lying around so asteroids are basically that once the solar system was formed these are the leftovers that are scattered you know in our solar system by studying whatever is scattered you can you can as a detective find out whether a roti was cooked in that kitchen or a cake was cooked in that kitchen okay. you understand what i'm saying so this is basically what we are doing right now by studying these building blocks it is helping us understand the path of journey that the solar system took to become what it is today so great question yes. very nice question yes so i also remember that the uh samples from that mission came back around a week one or two week earlier right. only yeah. and, and yeah, they yeah. have proved that uh, there are uh, they have successfully got some of the samples they have yes. that that's right that. a lot yes. more than what they were expecting they were expecting yes. a few grams but it seems like they have got a lot more yes yes okay yeah. okay so that's very nice information that you shared sir okay so the next question is from surbhi bajaj she is saying that there is atmosphere in uh, saturn's moon titan what is the composition of the atmosphere is it like a earth or what it is mainly methane um it is mainly methane <clears throat> it is having some amount of carbon dioxide carbon monoxide but it is mainly uh, consisting of methane gas so and methane is uh, is a sign of li- like previous <clears throat> life right like earth uh, earlier had ancient earth had methane that's true uh, but in this case the entire planet is full of methane so okay. if when that's we find not- trace yeah so when we find trace elements of methane they are mainly produced by biological organisms and they can also be found by geological methods also so that is why on mars uh, we are sending a lot of methane sensing instruments and trying to understand the variation of methane uh, in the atmosphere over a period of time so yes that is true that methane is something that is produced by life but it can also be produced by geological or other non biological methods right okay. why it is important to understand methane at those cold temperatures is because it it is formed in the, it is uh, present in the liquid form so it can uh, substitute what water is doing on our planet in terms of supporting how life has you know formed methane can do that on titan okay okay so okay so the next question i have from from lakshmiv so he is asking sir what is the difference between astrobiology and biology so astrobiology is a very vast field um it is something where you are trying to answer questions which require the knowledge of biology also physics also engineering also chemistry also philosophy also there is a lot of philosophical philosophy related work also uh, which goes into trying to understand what life is and biology is of course the the study of living organisms per se in general astrobiology focuses on life in space it is mainly focusing on what is it that 
is needed to to be known to confirm whether life exists outside or not yeah okay so i have very interesting question coming in from vrito shri biswas so he is asking sir can tardigrades survive on asteroids <laughs> <laughs> i do not know maybe um, <laughs> yeah. we have seen tardigrades survive in space um that's a good question i do not have a direct answer to that and i don't know many people who would because we have not sent any tardigrades to asteroids mm. but in principle it should be able to because an asteroid is basically a cold dark surface uh, devoid of any oxygen and uh, it is having a lot of radiation and we have seen tardigrades survive in space in similar kinds of conditions yes, so biopan mission so in such environments if they are surviving there is a chance that it could survive Uh, you know on an asteroid but a tardigrade even though it is a very small organism it is a very highly evolved organism so for it to be found on an asteroid is a different question altogether hmm. yeah that's true so yeah i mean yeah so we have some questions like this also so here okay so uh okay so let me pick some questions so, so here is rinki kotak so she is asking sir can you Please, can you please tell if a astrobiologist can go to a space or yeah so very good question um so there is an ast- there is an astronaut who has been selected in the last selection who actually is an astrobiologist mm-hmm. normally uh, whenever astro uh, astronaut selections are made they are either um, pilots or you will have uh, scientists or engineers uh, who are basically working in space environments but in the past like for example when astronauts were selected to go to the moon uh, harrison smith was uh, you know one astronaut who was actually a civilian astronaut who was a geologist a geology researcher whose uh, main focus was in helping understand the lunar surface because he was you know going on the last mission to the moon so in the future of course uh, there will be opportunities for um, uh, astrobiologists to also go into space it is a very critical area of uh, of research important for uh, human space exploration so by all means you will be eligible to apply for uh, becoming an astronaut if you uh, decide to become an astrobiologist yeah okay so yes yeah, so so, mm. so uh, let me ask you a, a couple of questions while arjun sure. is Sure, sure. Filtering through. So, uh, yeah, yeah uh, you know, is the desert atmosphere uh, environment that you're working in is that uh, how is that similar to analog Mars or uh, other such and uh, planets that we might go and think of settling in later? Okay, so like if we consider Ladakh, and uh, there are other similar areas on our planet. One is in the Atacama Desert in South America also. so these are environments which receive a very little amount of rainfall and because of that over a period of time they have undergone uh, desertification where they have become deserts so why we are interested in these cold dry desert environments is because the chances of any preservation of life that would have taken place is a lot more there because any form of weathering that we find in our cities there's a lot of rainfall that takes place um, wind snow activity it tends to wash out and you lose the preservation over time so places like ladakh are very pristine they have preserved their surface their topological features over hundreds and thousands of years if not more and uh, even the biological activity that we find there has evolved over such a long period of time that it does not require the same kinds of water levels the same kinds of temperatures that normal life on earth requires so what we are trying to study is twofold one is we want to understand what early mars was like so for us to understand what early mars was like today's ladakh is similar to what Mar- uh, mars was like 2 billion years ago right okay. that is the first objective to understand early mars the second objective is to understand if we were to find the proof of life on today's mars what is the likelihood of finding what kind of life has the highest likelihood of being found what kind of life are we looking for and what kind of life would it look like today so to answer this question also ladakh is important 
because you go to places where you are having a lot of salt and salt as we know is something which kills life you know that's why when we uh, make any pickle or when we try to preserve something we put salt on it because salt dehydrates it absorbs all the moisture out and uh, it breaks down the cell walls inside these organisms and it kills them but in ladakh and similar kinds of places even in kutch for that matter in gujarat the great ran of kutch uh, where you have these massive salt flats we find that there are some kind of special bacteria and archaea that are able to live in these very salty conditions and in fact not just live they are able to thrive they do very well in these kind of conditions so those organisms again pull us back to ladakh to help us understand you know why is it that these organisms are living in these conditions and both of these things help us uh, you know uh, improve our instruments and our experiments for mars if we are able to test it out here and confirm it in a natural environment we are able to be better prepared for going on mars and you know conducting and uh, finding out whatever questions that we have chosen for our experiment right yeah thanks for that detailed answer and um, mm-hmm. another question i have is you talked mostly about finding life in our solar system mm-hmm. and uh, astrobiologists <laughs> are also looking outside at exoplanets and uh, that kind of thing right and is so my question is uh, could you just comment on that a bit just to introduce the students to that sure absolutely so just like i mentioned in my, in our in my talk our solar system is supported by our sun and similarly there are other uh, stars which also have planets that revolve around them this is something which has been confirmed we are we have been able to find that there are planets outside our solar system also and they are orbiting uh, stars other other stars and these planets are called extra solar planets or exoplanets exo meaning out of so they are not part of the solar system they are part of a different sun system that exists out there so the question is that if there are these conditions that make earth a perfect place for life to start here there could be that that particular planet which is revolving around another star is also having good conditions for it to you know sustain life there and we have flown different kinds of telescopes into space the hubble space telescope right. is one very successful example which is a telescope which was flown to confirm the presence of planets which are like earth and they have been found to exist you know light years away from us in different uh, sun systems and it is very important for us to identify and characterize these planets there is very little information that we can get out of them because they are so far away so the most we can right now do is we can determine the size of those planets right we can determine the distance from their stars and we have also gone to the level of understanding what kind of atmosphere they will be having based on the kind of uh, light signature that is coming back into the telescope's lens from them even that level of detailing has been done but for anything more than that we will either need stronger telescopes or we will need to go towards them to understand them which will take a lot of time but this is a field a very exciting field where there are different people there are a few people in india who are studying exoplanets uh, i can tell you dr margarita safonova uh, at the indian institute of astrophysics and there are some other people couple of other people in bangalore who are doing that uh, but on an international level there are many people who are interested in exoplanets and trying to determine right. the likelihood of life existing in these planet systems yeah that's uh, yeah i think it's uh, uh, with kepler and tess uh, missions uh, there's a lot more knowledge has been added about exoplanets but like you say it's too far away so it's a whole different kind of research it's only observational right now that's true yeah right so let me bring you to a career question because so many kids will be wondering about that is astrobiology can it be done at the undergraduate level or only the graduate level and also what kind of subjects should the, should these high school kids study so that they have that option open to them later on in their life so uh, unfortunately as of now astrobiology is not offered as an undergraduate degree um, but students uh, i would encourage them to to select their most interesting science or engineering field uh, you know whether that is physics chemistry Uh, geology even mathematics or even engineering different kinds of engineering earth sciences engineering 
geophysics, geochemistry. So try to study the fundamental sciences in your undergraduate. And then when you are going in, and then if you want to stay connected with astrobiology, keep trying to do a summer project or an internship as part of uh, an astrobiology group. And there are a few astrobiology groups here in India. I am, I'll be happy to share a list of uh, organizations that have been working in that area. Um, so try to spend the, the summer in trying to develop some skill sets in astrobiology. And then once you move into your master's and PhD, that is where you can specialize in the field of astrobiology. So at Amity, we are having plans to start a course in astrobiology. In fact, we did an online course, very successful course, where right. we had almost 650 people from around the world uh, who did an introduction to astrobiology course. And uh, hopefully next year also, we will be able to you know, uh, take it up. And in addition to that, we also want to start a degree program in astrobiology, but not uh, within the next year, perhaps in 2022. So until then, I would encourage students to uh, take up their chosen degree of choice. And in addition to that, uh, take up as many astrobiology projects as you can. In fact, this uh, project in uh, Ladakh that I mentioned would be an excellent entry point for students who are interested in astrobiology. Yes, so we will share that uh, information with all the students. Uh, so uh, they'll have the opportunity to th think if they want to go in summer or later on. Yeah. So uh, another question I had is uh, students who are studying biology in undergraduate, have they already cut themselves out of going for astrobiology because they do need the physics and science, more science background, or are they also still uh, eligible to go for that? I think in my mind, and uh, there are many people who think like me, you can never cut yourself out of anything. So right. you might be studying arts also right now, or you might even be studying philosophy. But I know people who have come from different walks of life and have been able to you know, get in. So mm -hmm. you might be studying biology, chemistry, physics, and you, you, there will be a lot of opportunities for you to take up the right skills before you apply into a master's program or a PhD program. So it is unfortunately only in India where there are these very strict right. eligibility criteria where you need to have a, bi a biology or a chemistry to take up something. So you should make use of the fact that right now there is no astrobiology program. So you can study whichever field that is there of your interest, even astronomy, astrophysics, if that is the case. And right. you can still be able to, uh, you know, there are a lot of certificate courses, different programs. In fact, the program that we conducted is also going to be offered next year. So such programs will add value to your current degree and will better prepare you to apply for, uh, you know, astrobiology related program. Right. Yeah, I think that that was a very good answer. So students will actually know how to proceed in this, in this field that's definitely going to grow a lot in the next few years, I guess. So, yeah. Yeah. Arjun, do you have any uh, uh, last questions? No, ma'am. Okay, so uh, okay. okay, so if, if we have the time, I can take one take up one more question. Yeah, so one it last is question. from yeah, one last question. So it is from Anvi Kumar. So she's uh, she asks uh, how did Mars lose its atmosphere? And Great is question. it yeah. is, is it possible to recreate uh, it uh, once it is lost? Great question. So Mars um, <clears throat> there are several things that happened. One very important thing to keep in mind is that uh, any planet has its own mass, its own weight that it exerts on everything that's on it, whether that is solid or even an atmosphere. So the reason why Earth today is having its atmosphere is because the Earth's gravity, the Earth's mass is exerting gravity that is pulling everything towards itself over a period of time. Mars, on the other hand, is a smaller planet it is having a lesser amount of gravitation pull. So if you were to walk on the surface of Mars, it will going to be about one third in terms of the gravity force that it is exerting on you. So similarly, the amount of gases that are present on the surface of Mars that were, you know, and atmospheres change based on the evolution of the planet. Uh, the gases that come out from underneath the Earth's surface, they eventually constitute the atmosphere and some of that atmosphere escapes also over a period of time. How that uh, atmospheric escape takes place is because the gases are held in because of the force that the planet is exerting over a period of time. And there is a constant amount of production of gases that is taking place from underneath the planet's surface that is maintaining that amount of uh, gases in the atmosphere. 
so mars slowly and steadily as it was forming as it was going away and forming itself stabilizing itself in its orbit uh, it was not able to hold on to the amount of gases over a period of time so there was a duration where the build up of oxygen was taking place on its surface but because the gravity content was not strong enough it lost out all of that heavy gases so gases like oxygen and all are quite heavy and uh, carbon dioxide and others are relatively lighter so they so all of the lighter gases in fact uh, sorry i said the other way around the, the lighter mm. gases in fact escape first so things like helium hydrogen that's why even on earth when you try to have a helium balloon you'll find that it escapes because it is such a light gas that earth's gravity is not strong enough to hold on to it whereas if you go to larger planets like jupiter and saturn they are exerting a lot more amount of gravity force and it is able to hold on to gases like uh, helium and hydrogen you know closer to it mars is an even smaller planet than earth so it is not able to hold on to the lighter forms of gases so oxygen being a lighter gas escaped so over a period of time the planet's mass and its uh, gravity force was not strong enough to hold on to the amount of oxygen that was being uh, brought out by the surface whether that is in the form of any kind of a water cycle uh, that constantly ensures certain amount of gases atmospheric uh, uh, you know like water vapor and all that are emitted just like on earth we have a constant cycle of gases whether that is nitrogen uh, carbon dioxide and oxygen so similar kinds of processes have been taking place on uh, mars as well and uh, because of its structure because of its size after a certain point of time when there had been a certain amount of build up it was not able to hold on to it and all of those gases escaped <coughs> and because of this we now know that 99% of mars atmosphere is of carbon dioxide is carbon dioxide yeah. and to answer the second part of the question yes theoretically it is possible that uh, you are able to inject more and more amount of carbon dioxide into the planet and uh, because of that carbon dioxide build up you are having um, more amount of heat that is coming from the sun that becomes trapped and that will lead to the change in the dynamics of the planet the weather pattern of the planet and uh, because of that a lot of the frozen ice that is there it will melt a lot of that evaporation will take place and because of that evaporation again there will be more oxygen that will go into the atmosphere so there will be a period of time where you will be able to recreate uh, this thing but it is easy to say then do because at a global scale at such a large scale to conduct these kinds of processes it is very hard in fact even on our own planet we have not able to achieve such kinds of complex uh, you can say dynamics we still don't have a complete understanding of how it happens but there are many books uh, and and there's a lot of studies that have been done that tell how on mars such kinds of uh, environments can be created yeah thank you for that a wonderful answer sir yeah. wonderful answer and um, you know just for the students and for you i'd like to share that stem and space is uh, uh, currently conducting a mars exploration workshop it's a 12 week uh, space club on mars exploration and is there search for uh, is there life on mars so everything you added uh, spoke about today is very relevant to all the students who are participating with us and for anybody else who'd like to join uh, we are starting a new session uh, from tomorrow so uh, thanks again sudhat for joining and uh, telling us so many things about astrobiology and where that is headed thank you again for this opportunity and uh, hopefully some of the students who are listening get the uh, inspiration to join uh, you know uh, astrobiology and i will also leave the link for the uh, next summer program uh, yeah you please program. share it with me and i'll i'll share it with all the uh, i mean you can put it here but yeah. i will also share it with all the students, students uh, well. because they're we're all they're all on all on our mailing list so. sounds good okay thank, thank you, you so again. much thank, thank you arjun, thank you arjun for,